Eddie Rickenbacker was a lifelong leader in the first days of auto racing through two world wars and in the development of the airline industry. This story of his World War I heroics is told in his words and by his niece, Marion Darby. I have just been promoted to command of the 94th Squadron. I must now work harder than I did before, and I shall never ask a pilot to go on any mission that I won't go on. The 94th Squadron was the first American trained pursuit unit to fight at the front, and my uncle, Captain Andy Rickenbacker, was one of its first leaders. September 25th, 1918 was his first day of command. Over Verdun, I spotted them coming two German reconnaissance planes and five Fokkers flying protection. All seven went by underneath me. I cut back the engine and dived silently on the last Fokker. He glanced behind him at the same moment that I pressed my triggers. I should have quit when I was ahead, but I wanted a double header before breakfast. I leveled out, kicked my nose around to the left and began firing. The nearest reconnaissance plane sailed right on through my bullets. For those two victories, Uncle Eddie was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the United States' highest military award. His inspired squadron soon became the deadliest American aviation unit on the Western Front. Ever since I was a boy in Columbus, Ohio, I used to lie awake nights wishing that I could fly. When I was nine, I thought I'd finally figured out a way. He attached an umbrella to his bicycle and careened off the tin roof of a neighbor's barn. A few years later, Uncle Eddie was building, then selling, a relatively safer contraption, the automobile. In 1911, at age 20, he drove in the first Indianapolis 500, and by 1914, his death-defying exploits had made him famous. Racing was a major sport, and drivers were lionized. We were front page news. One Los Angeles reporter cooked up a wildly imaginative story to the effect that I was really Baron Edward von Rickenbacker, a Prussian nobleman. I shrugged it off. But he should have paid more attention, because in 1914, the world and Uncle Eddie's life changed forever. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne, ignited a full-scale multi-nation war. Austria, Hungary, and Germany invaded neighbors on two fronts, while Russia, France, and Great Britain fought back. A complex system of alliances quickly drew in other countries to both sides. The Central Powers and the Allies became locked in a deadly, entrenched battle along the eastern and western fronts. Soldiers died by the thousands, tens of thousands, for nothing more than a few feet of land, the hapless victims of obsolete strategies and deadly new weapons, such as machine guns, long-range artillery, observation balloons, airplanes, armored tanks, and poison gas. Meanwhile, the United States of America, an ocean away and teeming with immigrants from all warring countries, tried to remain neutral. I believe that to go into this war would be a crime against the nation and the world. But events drew the European battle closer to home. In 1916, a British racing team, short on drivers due to the war, invited Uncle Eddie to England. At the time of my crossing, German U-boats were prowling the North Atlantic, but American ships were supposed to have the freedom of the high seas. Arriving in Liverpool, Eddie was abruptly detained by British authorities. <laughs> what a dossier they had on me. They were obviously familiar with that ridiculous sports page fiction about my being a German baron, suddenly it dawned on me that I was suspected of being a German spy. Uncle Eddie was finally permitted into England, where he witnessed firsthand the effects of war. I admired the quiet courage and determination that I encountered on every hand. 
More than ever, I was convinced that Americans should join the Allies and the underdogs. And if they did, aviation was where I was going to serve. When Germany declared unrestricted submarine warfare on the high seas, Eddie rushed back home with a mission. I arranged to visit several cities from New York to Los Angeles to make public pleas for all-out participation in the war. There was widespread sentiment that the United States should contribute munitions and money, but not troops. My slogan was the three M's, men, money, munitions. With national sentiment rising in support of the Allies, and American ships endangered, President Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany. The world must be made safe for democracy. The day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles which gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured. Within a month, Uncle Eddie was on the first ship to France. Not as a pilot, but as a driver for the staff of General John J. Pershing, leader of the American Expeditionary Force. Although I never drove for the general, I did drive for General Billy Mitchell, America's great air pioneer. Thanks to that connection and a few others, Eddie became a pilot. And in March of 1918, I was dispatched to the 94th Aero Pursuit Squadron. It had taken me almost a year to reach the front as a combat pilot, but I was there. And so was the greatest pilot of them all, Major Raoul Lufberry. He had shot down 17 enemy aircraft, more than any other U.S. flyer. Uncle Eddie was thrilled when Lufberry chose him and another pilot for the new squad's first flight over enemy lines. Below us was a scene that was appalling. Armies had been fighting over that once beautiful farmland for more than three years, and what was left was wasteland. Not a house, not a barn, not a tree was left standing. Uncle Eddie's brother, Louis, was an infantryman in those trenches. Uncle Louis used to laugh that while Eddie was flying around in the sky, he was crawling in the mud. The ground soldiers had to live with damp, cold trenches, poison gas, and the lack of food. Both my uncles were lucky. Flyers and foot soldiers alike faced a 50% chance of injury or death. In all, almost 9 million soldiers from both sides of the war died in battle, including the American pilot with the most victories, Ace of Aces, Major Lufberry. It happened on May 10th. Major Raoul Lufberry had just been shot down in flames not six miles away from our field. Eyewitnesses saw him squirm out of the blazing cockpit and climb onto the fuselage. Then he jumped. Death by burning was the death we dreaded more than any other. By the end of May, Uncle Eddie had avenged his friend and hero. Scoring five victories, he was now officially an ace himself. Over the next few months, the title, Ace of Aces, would pass from one pilot, Major Raoul Lufberry, to another, Lieutenant Paul Frank Bear. And another. Lieutenant Frank Luke. The honor carried the curse of death. By late September, with just seven victories, I became the American Ace of Aces. That September, he also became the new commander of the 94th. During the month of October, I shot down 14 enemy aircraft. On the 30th, I got my 25th and 26th victories. The 94th downed 69 planes, more than any other American unit, our last victory coming on November 10th, 1918. And on that same day, the pilots received a long-awaited message. An almost hysterical voice shouted the news in my ear. At 11 o'clock the following morning, the war would end. The next morning, orders came down that all pilots should stay on the ground. Captain Eddie, however, slipped out for a last solo flight. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, this is what he saw. On both sides of no man's land, the trenches erupted. Brown uniformed men poured out of the American trenches, gray-green uniforms out of the German. From my observer's seat overhead, I could see them hugging each other, dancing, jumping, after four years of slaughter and hatred. Star shells, rockets, and flares began to go up. I turned my ship toward the field. The war was over. 
Uncle Eddie's World War I heroism made him a national celebrity. He gave speeches, toured, and received many awards, including the Congressional Medal of Honor. But as early as 1922, while on his honeymoon in Berlin, Uncle Eddie sensed the possibility of another war. I saw German children wearing shoes without soles, their emaciated bodies and drawn faces clearly undernourished. German morale, already low, was falling. Under such conditions, people will turn to any glimmer of hope, to any prophet, true or false. My Uncle Eddie's World War I exploits are honored here at the United States Air Force Museum. The museum is dedicated to preserving the history of aviation, a history in which my uncle played a proud part even after World War I. He risked his life on a mission in World War II, and as president of Eastern Airlines, led that company to international prominence. But to me, he'll always be Uncle Eddie.